on. You guys can grab a seat. No, there's power in intercession. There's power in praying for other people. The beauty of prayer is it doesn't just have to be us telling God, hey, I want you to do X, Y, and Z in my life. We can also be like, hey, God, that person who I can't touch, you can. Because God is not limited by time or space, and he can do the impossible in, in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. Um... <clears throat> Transitions, I don't know. Uh, well, good morning, church. Good morning. I don't know why, but my brain is all over the place this morning, so enjoy. Um, but welcome to week three of a series that we're calling The Paradox of Generosity. Ooh, I like that. Some people said it with me. Let's say it together. The Paradox of Generosity. Come on, come on. Sorry, squirrel moments. Just easily distracted sometimes. I'm so sorry. Oh, well. Um, but this is a series that is all about money. And I know our society, we as people, we don't like to talk about money. We don't like to talk about it with friends or family members. We don't like when people know how much we make or how we spend our money or where we invested. Or we, we just, we, money makes us, a lot of people feel uncomfortable. And it's a topic that in the church all too often gets painted in very negative pictures because all too often the church, when we talk about money, it's all about give me money. As if that's the only biblical perspective. The biblical perspective isn't about getting people to give you money. It's about having the right standard of money in your life. And so this is a series that I know it's going to make some people uncomfortable, but the reality is we're talking about money not because we're in a difficult financial position and not because I'm like, ooh, we need to make a budget and I want to convince people to give us more money. No, that's not the motivation. We're talking about money. Also, those things aren't true. But we're talking about money because Jesus talked about money. And it's important that the church stops standing on the sidelines when it comes to topics that Jesus talked about. When Jesus talked, he talked about what was important. He had three years of ministry on this earth. He talked about what mattered. And one of the things Jesus talked about was money, proper management, stewardship of our money. His perspective wasn't give me money. His perspective was make sure that money doesn't hold your heart. And so through this series, we're, we're talking about this topic, but I want to be very, very, very clear before anyone gets up and you're like, oh my goodness, they're talking about money. Oh, it's one of those churches. We're going to leave now. No, before we get there, I want to be clear. The goal of this message, the goal of this series is not to convince you to give us a penny. We're not going to use manipulation coercion, guilt tactics, fear tactics, anything else that you might have encountered in churches before to be like, give us more money. In fact, I've instructed our hosting team at the end of the service not to even mention the tithes or offerings because I do not want a single person here to hear my words as manipulation. I don't want a single one of you to give a dime to this church that God doesn't tell you to give. This isn't about convincing you to give. This is about showing you where your heart is. And in fact, throughout this series, we've, we've decided to give away $15,000 to support the work of missions abroad and, and locally in our community to help people in need. And, and this past week, I had the opportunity to donate, if we can throw up the next slide, we donated $5,000 to the Alliance Canada, that's our national office, to support their global advance, that's missions work. Specifically, and what I love about this is, we gave $2,500 just to support missionaries, like people spreading the gospel in other countries, and we gave $2,500, you know, we're doing a building project, we're trying to build, all that stuff. We gave $2,500 to help build churches in Nepal, which I just think is awesome, come on. Because money is not about us. It's not about what you have. It's about what God has called you to do with what he has given you. Money is a tool to be used to bless us and, this is the part where society misses, to bless us and to bless others. 
So throughout this series so far, we've, we've talked about our perspective when it comes to money. About how often people will have one of two perspectives. It's poverty or it's prosperity. It's money is bad or money is good. It's, oh, I'm never going to have enough money. My life is over. This, I, I, it's a fear of lack or it's futility. Oh, my money is to be used for my own pleasure and that's it. We've talked about how those two views are counter to each other, but they miss the point how Jesus says money is meant to have a purpose. It's supposed to, he gives us money for a purpose, to bless us and to bless others. How resources are like a blessing that God pours out. It's like a river that comes from his throne. And as he blesses us, we are called to be a blessing to others. And if we have the wrong perspectives, if we have poverty, we block the blessing from coming to us. If we have prosperity, we block the blessing from coming to others. But the point is we miss out on what God wants to do. So money has a purpose. And then last week we talked about our focus when it comes to money. Specifically how our culture likes to teach us that that money needs to be used for my benefit. I need more. I need more. And the reality Jesus reveals of, of, of the, the, the spirit of mammon that operates on money, the spirit of greed that operates on money, that we can either submit our money to God or to the enemy. Money doesn't, it's not neutral. It's in one of the two camps. It's our choice where we submit it. Now, money, God says, is meant to be a seed, that as we sow it in faith as he tells us to, it will grow and produce blessings in our lives and in the lives of people around us. Not always financial blessings, but blessings from heaven still. But this morning, I want to dig into a topic that is perhaps one of the more difficult topics to talk about when it comes to to money and finances, because this is a topic where it will be extremely easy for some of you to read between the lines and be like, ooh, he just wants to stick his hand in my pocketbook and take my money. And that, again, that's not the goal. That's not the goal. But I want to talk this morning about a particular specific principle of stewardship that God outlines in his word that Jesus affirms and calls us to practice principle of stewardship, which many people in the church like to reject and avoid and whatnot because we're worried that we'll never have enough. It's the principle of tithes and offerings. And again, it's really easy. The room just got really quiet. I love it. It's really easy to read between the lines and be like, ooh, because we hear about tithes and offerings only in a church setting. And often, pastors teach it's about giving money to the church, which I think is true, but the church is more than an organization. It's also the people. And so we're calling this message the test of a tenth. And now I know in this room, there are likely a number of different types of people. We likely have people who are like, I mentioned the words tithes and offering, and you're like, what? That's fine. I'll explain it in a minute. But we also have people in this room who you've been a part of churches where it's been taught well. And I say the words and you're like, oh yeah, totally. That's fine. That's great. But I do know that there's a subset of Christianity and a subset of people who teach lies when it comes to tithes and offerings. And often, because of how the church has a history of manipulating people into giving, Often what happens is we put up shields to protect ourselves from, from this manipulation, these manipulation tactics. And often what happens with that, when we put up a shield, shields are indiscriminate. It, prevent, it protects us, but it also prevents God from blessing us. And so we have to be careful with what shields we have. But I know there are likely people in this room who I said the words tithes and offerings, and you're like, how dare you? You're talking about tithes and offerings. That is an Old Testament principle. Get rid of it. So my goal, quite simply, through this message, this is a teaching message. This is not a preaching message. I'm going to teach you the principles from the Bible. But my goal through this message is to demonstrate that the tithe 
and offerings. Yes, it was a Mosaic law principle. Yes, the Mosaic law has passed, but actually, the tithes and offerings predate the Mosaic law by 430 years and are supported by Jesus. Again, before you tune me out, if you don't know what tithe and offering is, let me just explain really, really briefly, very simple. The tithe is 10% of your, is, is a call to give 10% of your increase to God. So in the old days when you would grow crops, it was literally bring 10% of the crops you grow to the temple. In the time of Moses and the and, and nation of Israel, between Moses and Jesus, it kind of turned into a tax that was used to support the temple. But the principle has always been the tithe is giving 10% of your increase. For us nowadays, that's our paychecks to God. Offerings on the other side are anything over and above. See, tithes are mandated in Scripture. Offerings are just a generous gift over and above. Tithes are giving generously to God out of our increase and giving Him 10%. Offerings are giving God over and above the 10% as He calls us or as we feel led. And that is the overall principle. But I know, as I said earlier, there are people who are like, oh, well, tithes, it comes in the first half of the Bible before Jesus, so it doesn't matter. So first question I want to kind of address is where did the tithe actually come from? See, if we look at the Bible and we were to break the Bible into three periods of redemptive history, that is three periods of God's work throughout humanity from after, after Adam and Eve sinned and brought sin into the world and until, I mean, now, ultimately, until Revelation 20 happens and heaven comes to earth. It's these three periods that we see expressed throughout the Bible. And the first one is the period of Abrahamic promise. So this is a period early, early, early in Genesis where God comes to one man named Abram and he says, hey, I'm calling you to leave your family, to leave your friends, to leave everything you're comfortable with, and to go to a faraway land that I'm going to give your descendants. And in this period, Abraham, he obeys God. His name is, it starts as Abram, and then it becomes Abraham. God changes his name as he gives him a prophetic destiny. And, 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 and it's this period of promise. That God speaks promises to Abraham about blessing the whole world through him. And it says, God says, I will bless you through your descendant. And Abraham's like, ah, I'm too old. I'm 90 and my wife's 90. We can't have kids. And God's like, watch me. So it's a period of promise. And basically, we can sum it up as saying, like, it was a period where God chose select individuals and worked through their life to bring the rest of the world into relationship with him. And then the second period we see is the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Law. It comes 430 years later, according to Galatians 3. And this is where, basically, God frees Israel from captivity in Egypt. He leads them out into the desert, and he's like, hey, guys, I'm going to appear on this mountain. I'm going to speak to Moses. And when you hear the loud trumpet sound, this is Exodus 19 and 20, when you hear the loud trumpet sound, you are to come to me so that I can have a relationship with you. And the people of Israel, they see God on the mountain, they see this cloud, they hear the thunder, they hear Moses talking to God, and they are afraid. And when they hear the loud trumpet sound, they say to Mount Moses, no, 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 we're not going anywhere near that mountain. Tell God, give us a list of rules, we'll obey them, that's that, done. And God's like, well, I want a relationship with you, but you want, okay, you want rules? Here you go. Here's a thousand rules. <laughs> Good luck. And then, about 1,400 years later, we come to New Covenant, or, or Jesus. So Old Covenant, God is working through a nation, the descendants of Abraham, to spread his love to the world. And then we come to the New Covenant with Jesus, where Jesus, he fulfills the law, he closes the chapter on the law, and he releases us into new life in the Spirit. 
Galatians 5 tells us those who are in the spirit are subject to no law. We do not have to follow the Mosaic law any longer because Jesus has set us free to obey a higher law, the law of the spirit, which is led through our consciousness and relationship with God. And, but Galatians 3 tells us about this new covenant. We have Abraham's promise that God would bless all people through Abraham's descendant. And Galatians 3 says, notice, it says descendant, not descendants. The descendant is Jesus. God would bless all people through Jesus. That through him we can all now have relationship with God, whether we are part of Israel or not. I know, you're like, what, what's the point? What, you're giving me a history lesson on this. This is great. Well, the point is, a lot of Christians, we like to draw a line right here and say anything before this is law and should be rejected, and anything after this is Jesus and we can obey. And so we create this divide in our Bible, and it's like, oh, where's Matthew? Oh, there's Matthew. Oh, that, that's not even the first chapter, but whatever. Anything before Matthew 1... That's law, we don't have to obey it. Which, A, is absurd. Because think about it, the law, 10 commandments, God says do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, all these kinds of things. So if we're to follow that argument to its logical conclusion, if we have to do away with all of that, we should all be murderers and adulterers and thieves. Just logically speaking. But even past that, 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all Scripture, it doesn't say new Scripture, it doesn't say anything after Jesus, all Scripture is God-breathed. That means every word in this book, its source is God. The source of the Bible is God. It is ultimate truth because it comes from the one who cannot lie. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for correction, for teaching, for training, and for rebuking until all believers might be equipped to do every good work. So we create this divide. But the Bible clearly says, well, there isn't a divide. Yeah, there's a list of rules that maybe you don't need to follow anymore, like don't wear cotton or mixed fabrics or whatnot. Like there's, there's rules in there that you don't need to follow anymore, but it's all useful. But even if we were to say that this divide were accurate and anything that's old covenant mosaic law we can just rip out of the Bible and not use, even if we were to say that's true, it's not, but let's just say it's true. If that were true, there is a period 430 years before the law came where God spoke, had relationship with people that was defined by a relationship with him and defined by the Abrahamic promise. So where did the tithe come from? Well, it came from the Abrahamic promise. Let me prove it to you. Genesis 14. Basically, the story goes, Abraham is called by God to go to this foreign land. He goes, God blesses him. He has a lot of kids, or well, not a lot of kids at the time, but, but he, he eventually has kids. He has a lot of flocks. He has a lot of servants. He has, he's, he's very, very blessed. And his brother tags along, and both of them are very blessed to the point that where they settle, the land can't support all their, their animals and families. And so they decide, oh, Lot, you'll go over there. I'll go over here. Cool. That's great. We'll visit each other on the weekends. Cool. Done. But then this thing happens where an enemy king comes and attacks Lot, and he carries off Lot and his family and all of his possessions. And Abram's like, that's my brother. You don't touch my brother unless you want to mess with me. Which, side note, the Bible says we are all children of God. Jesus is our brother. He's our big brother. He's not very happy when people mess with his children. Side note. But he goes, Abram goes, and he fights this king. He takes his men, he fights this king, he wins a battle, he gets a bunch of plunder. And then it comes to this passage in, in Genesis 14, verse 18. It says, And King Melchizedek of Salem, so Salem is the old, or scholars believe was the old name for Jerusalem prior to Israel, like taking the promised land and, and forming the nation of Israel. So this is, again, 430 years before that happens. King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. 
Now, this is fascinating because the Bible, we have like three passages really that talk about Melchizedek. One is here, one in Psalms, and a bunch in, in Hebrews. And we don't really know much about Melchizedek except, well, I guess one, his name is hard to pronounce. Um, but two, he's a king who serves God. He's a king who is a priest to God. And the nation of Israel hasn't been formed yet. We don't have, like, he, he's not an Israelite. Israel is not a thing. He's just a random dude who has a relationship with God. And I just love that because it tells me that there's, a, there's people who we have not heard the stories of, who lived, breathed, and died and served God, who aren't even mentioned in this book. Melchizedek, he, he serves God. He's a king, but he's also a priest. Priests had access. They could commune with God. We are all priests, Second Peter tells us. But he's a king who's a priest, and Hebrews tells us that he is actually a foretaste of the coming perfect king and priest named Jesus, who came and died on the cross to save us from our sins. So he's a kingly priest who's a representative of Jesus. And it says, Melchizedek blessed Abram and said, blessed be Abram by God most high, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Just a really cool moment. Melchizedek is like, hey, Abram, good fight. You won. I was all God. Just calling him back. Hey, this is, this is who God is. God did this for you. It's a king who's a priest. He serves God. And Melchizedek, he blesses Abram. And in response, what does Abram do? Because so I lose my page. There we go. This is Abram gave him one-tenth of everything. Where does the tithe come from? Well, right here. This is 430 years before the law. 430 years before a list of do's and don'ts. Years before Abram even has a son through whom God would bless the rest of the world. Before any of that happened, Abram gave God a tenth of everything. And what does God say in response? Chapter 15, it says, after these things, I love when the Bible is very clear about when things happened. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram, I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. So before the law ever came, God didn't institute the tithe, people did. Out of a response of gratitude for what God did in Abram's life, Abram gave to God one-tenth. He gave it to Melchizedek, a priest of God, in, as a blessing to God. And God said in response, I will protect you and I will bless you. And this is the principle of the tithe that we see throughout Scripture. Before the law ever came, the tithe was in place. We see it here in Abraham in Genesis 14. In Genesis 28, we see it with, with Jacob at Bethel. He has an encounter with God. And in response to this encounter with God, he says, God, I will give you a tenth of everything I ever get. Everything I get, I will give you a tenth of. In response to God's goodness, people gave. And they were generous. And throughout the scripture, we see this constantly happen. Yeah, the tithe was eventually enshrined in the Mosaic law. And yeah, it did eventually essentially become a tax where people were just expected to pay 10%. And yeah, in ancient Near East culture, tithing wasn't just limited to Israel, it was also in other nations. And in other nations, it was used to not only pay for the temple, but also to pay for the royalty and, and to take care of them. But the principle is an act of generosity to God. That's the start. Genesis 3, or Genesis 4, sorry, we see, see Abel 
Cain and Abel, they bring offerings to God. It says Cain brought some grain that he had grown. Abel brought the first and the best of his flock and offered them to God. God accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain's. Why? Because Abel brought the first, the best. It's the principle of the tithe. He gave him out of his increase. Not when he knew he had enough, like Cain, but before he knew he had enough, he said, here's the first God, and God blessed him. Genesis 14, we see with Abram. Genesis 28 with Jacob. We see in 2 Chronicles 31, yeah, this is Old Testament, but we see that King Hezekiah, he comes in, he gets put on the throne, and he realizes, oh, the people of God have not been obeying God's law. And so he does a public call, and he's like, hey, we need to obey God's law. This is important. And so they come in, and, and, and the people start to give to the temple and to tithe to God. And Hezekiah, one day, he goes into the temple, and, and, and he looks, and he's like, oh, my goodness, there's so much stuff. Did the people misunderstand me? Did they think I said 90%, not 10%? Like, like there, there's too much. Priests, the, the people must be starving. And the priests are like, no, they're not. They gave 10%. Then they got more than they ha ever had before. And they gave more than another 10%. And they got more than they had before. The people are just prospering as they've been obedient. Malachi 3, we see that God is speaking to his people through the prophet Malachi. And this is a period similar to Ezekiel where the people have just been like, yeah, God. Good for you. Get lost. We don't care. And God says to his people, I, the Lord, never change. He's like, that's why I haven't killed you. Which is just great, great first point. I never change. I love you, so I haven't killed you yet. Even though you're being a snotty-nosed, bratty child who deserves a swift kick. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> but then he says this. He says, you've robbed me. And they're like, what, what do you mean? How have we robbed you? And he says, you've robbed me and my tithes and offerings. I said, bring to me a tenth of your increase. And you said, no. So you're robbing me. Which implies a few interesting things. One, tithe, God expects. And two, it belongs to him. When God blesses us with money or resources, he does not bless us to give us 100%. He blesses us so we can bless him back, so we can partner with him. And God says, you've robbed me. And then he says this. He says, test me in this. I love that. Only time in the Bible that God says, test me. It's in context of money. Test me in this and see if I will not bless you if I will not rebuke the destroyer on your behalf, and I, I will not make your land prosper. Test me in this. The tithe is a test. Jesus talks about it this way in, in Matthew 6. This is not specifically about the tithe, but this is about money in general. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor, moth nor rust consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The tithe is a test. Where is your heart? How do we store up treasures in heaven? First Corinthians, I want to say it's five. I could be wrong on that. But he's talking about money. He says to those who are rich, he says, be generous. Do good works. Share with those who are in need. For in this way you will store up good treasures for yourself. Generosity to God is how we store up good treasures. The tithe is a test to see what has our heart. Is it money? Greed? Or is it God? The God of the universe who loves us more than we could ever imagine. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, okay, that's all great, but you haven't convinced me. I think anything before Matthew should just be ripped out of the Bible. It's pointless. There's no point. You haven't convinced me. Sure, Mosaic Law wasn't in place, but what does Jesus have to say about the topic? Actually, I never knew this when I was growing up. I only realized this a couple years ago. 
Jesus has something to say about the tithe specifically. Matthew 23. In this passage, basically, Jesus is lambasting. That's a new word that I just love using. He's ripping into the Pharisees and religious elite. And he starts it by, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, constantly throughout that passage. Not something you ever want to hear from Jesus. But he says this, verse 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin. Now, some of you are like, Wait, aren't those spices? Yeah. Yes. They were so legalistic in this that they would tithe the spices they grew at their house. And if they bought spices from a merchant and they didn't know if the merchant had tithed, they would tithe off the spices they bought. In my mind, I'm like, mint, dill, and cumin. I'm not a huge fan of mint, so, but, so I'm fine with tithing that. Dill, I'll tithe the whole 100%. Hate dill. But cumin, I love cumin. (laughs) Anyways, rabbit trail. (laughs) For you tithe mint, dill, and cumin. You give 10% of your spices to God. And yet, you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Saying you're fulfilling part of it, but you're forgetting an even more important part. Justice and mercy and faith. It says, it is these you, have ought, you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. Now, it doesn't matter which part of the verse you ascribe to the, it is these you ought to have practiced, because he gets you either way. He says, without neglecting the others. You ought to have practiced justice, mercy, and faith without forgetting to tithe. Or you ought to have practiced the tithe without forgetting justice, mercy, and faith. Either way, Jesus is saying, hey, give generously to me. And don't forget to take care of the people who are less fortunate than you. And this is actually what we see happen in the early church. In Acts, after Jesus has died He's risen from the dead. He ascends into heaven. He gives his Holy Spirit to his church, which is actually something we're going to be celebrating next Sunday. It's called Pentecost Sunday. It is going to be a fantastic service. You're not going to want to miss it. Going to have extended time of worship. Going to just take communion and and pray and be filled with the Holy Spirit and see God do incredible things in our lives. It's going to be amazing, so don't miss that. But after all that, the church is founded. And they start to grow and grow and grow and grow. And it says in the first day, they got like 5,000 people. And I think it's like the second day or a couple days later, they get another 4,000 people. Like this is a massive movement already. But Acts 4, what we see the church doing is they come to this place where it says there is not a needy person among them For as many as owned land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Now, this isn't a rule that God says we should do. This is just what they wanted to do. God says, give me the first tenth, and they're like, God, I'll give you 100%. I heard a pastor forever ago Whenever somebody would come to him and be like, the tithe is Old Testament, he's like, oh, well, Acts 4 says that we should give everything to God. So which would you rather? And usually they try to go back to the tithe. It's pretty funny. But this is what the early church did. They saw there was a need, and so they supplied for the need out of the blessing of what God had given them. God said, be generous. Give as I've called you to give. And they're like, how much? He's like, 10%. They're like, oh, that's it? Have everything, God. Everything that I have, I will give to you because you're so good. And I know that if I give everything to you, it won't matter because you will take care of me. There are testimonies out there, and I wouldn't encourage anyone to do this unless God specifically tells you to do this, but there are testimonies out there of people who God has said, hey, You're relying too much on money. You need to give everything. Sell your house, sell your cars, empty your savings account, give it all to me. And they do it. And God blesses them. 
and they never lack for a thing. Again, don't do it unless God tells you to do it, because when we're obedient to something God doesn't tell us to do, that doesn't say that he's going to bless us for being obedient to something he doesn't tell us to do. He blesses us for our obedience, for our yes. But when we are generous as God tells us to be generous, he will provide. See, that is the principle of the tithe. It's not meant to be a legalistic thing that we do in order to to just fulfill an Old Testament law. No, no, the point is that when you are generous, as God calls you to be generous, you will give 10% and more. It's not about following a law. It's just a reality that God calls us to give, and as we give as he calls us to give, we will give 10% and more. It's just what happens. Now, the question might be, okay, well, where does this money go? And there's differing views on this, and I'm not willing to take a firm stand on one side or the other. Some pastors will preach that it must go into the storehouse, into the house of God, into, like, the church building, into your local church. And I think there's biblical backing for that, but I also think there's biblical backing for the other side, which is that it needs to go to the church, which is not limited to a building. God never um, designates the church as being an organization that is registered with the CRA and has a nonprofit status and a license in order to be a church. No, he calls the church his people. We are the church. And so I think that I'm not willing to take a stand on either side, but I think you can make an argument that it should go to the church, corporately, the organization, or to the church to support people. Whether that's through your local church, whether that's through a nonprofit organization working on, uh, with God to, to further his ministry and help people in need in our city, whether that's just donating money to people you see around you who are in need, I think all of that could possibly apply. But the reality is that God has called us to give 10% of all that he gives us back to him. Because it belongs to him. And he wants to know what holds your heart. Is it money or is it God? God will not sit in the second seat of your heart. He wants to be first. He wants to be number one. And the tithe is a test to determine and demonstrate whether your heart belongs to God or to money. You know, Deuteronomy 8 tells us that the money we have, it belongs to God because it came from Him. He gave us the strength and the power and the might and life to earn the money, so it belongs to him. And the principle is that he blesses us so that we can be a blessing. And as he blesses us, all he asks is that we take care of his bride, the church. I read this illustration in in this book. It's called The Blessed Life. It's a fantastic book on generosity and tithing and giving and all that stuff. A lot of the series is actually based on this. It's Blessed Life by Robert Morris, just a fantastic resource. But in this book, he gives this illustration. And he says this, he says, consider this illustration. I have to go on an extended journey. And I choose three men for a special responsibility. I say to those three men, I'm going to send you $10,000 each month. Anyone want to jump on that gravy train? That sounds amazing. I'm going to send you $10,000 each month. He says, I, you may keep $9,000 of the money and do with it as you please, but I want you to give $1,000 each month to my wife for the meeting of her needs. As promised, he writes, I send each of these men $10,000 monthly. After a few months, I call my wife and ask her if she's receiving the support I had arranged. Her reply is, well, the first one is sending $1,000 each month, just as you instructed him. Check mark, good job. Gold star to you. Second one is actually sending $2,000 a month. I don't know why, but he is. Ooh, all right, that's a good guy. 
But the third one, he sent 800 the first month, 300 the second month, and nothing the third month. Now, Robert writes, as a husband who loves his wife with all his heart, what do you think I'm going to do? I am the one providing the money to these men. I've told them they can keep $9,000 for them, themselves. All I wanted them to do was give a mere 10% so there would be food in my house. Well, with the first man who is being faithful to follow my instructions, I'm going to continue sending him $10,000. But the third man, the one who wasn't satisfied with the 90% I graciously gave him, I'm going to quit sending him $10,000 a month. I'm going to send it to the second man, the more generous man instead. Why? Because I can trust the second man. He has demonstrated that he cares about what I care about. He is a good steward. What the third man was doing was the same as stealing from me. And he writes, now let me bring this illustration home. Jesus has gone away for a season of time. He has said to each of us, I want you to take care of my bride, the church, while I'm away by giving 10% to my house. You can spend the other 90% as you please. Those who obey will be blessed. Those who go above and beyond will be blessed even more. But from those who refuse to do even the minimum, he's going to take what they have and give it to someone who will be a good steward with it. Some of you might recognize that. That's the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, just a different retelling. But God, he blesses us so we can be a blessing. And what he asks in return is that we will be generous with what he has given us and faithfully provide for his church, whether that's the organization or supporting the people and those working to better society around them. He's not asking us to give to political campaigns and things like that. It's specifically to, 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 to support his mission. Whether it's through the church or whether it's through parachurch organizations, he wants to support his bride. And he's asking us, will you be faithful in doing what I've called you to do, in giving where I've called you to give, in supporting what I've called you to support? Will you be faithful in being generous to do what I've told you to do, even when it doesn't make sense? You know, I grew up in a Christian family. My parents, they were always tithing. They were always supporting God's work. And, and they taught that to my brother and I. And, and I saw as a kid, there's periods where, I, I mean, I didn't really have worries like taxes and groceries and utilities and whatnot. My parents dealt with that. But it was like my allowance was only so much, but I found when I gave, God would bless me back. So as a kid, I would, I would give, but there's a period where I moved out here to Alberta from Ontario and I'm living on my own. My parents are helping me with, with food and whatnot. I'm going to school and, and, and it's like, oh, well, I only have this much money each month to live. And I'm like, God, that, that's not enough money. And I just stop, just stop tithing, stop giving at all. It's like, God, if I give to you, I'm not gonna feed myself. I'm not gonna be able to survive. And then there was a period where I, I, I was working in a, in a tree nursery and I was earning a bit of money for myself. And, and then suddenly my roommate who I lived with, he lost his job, his girlfriend broke up with him and he settled into this deep depression. And for literally months, I was there paying my rent, his rent and food for both of us. I'm like, God, I cannot give. I do not have money. I, I, I don't have enough to supply for myself right now, God. How can you ask me to give? And then one day, I gave in and I was like, okay, God, I don't know, this is painful. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but, but I'm going to do it. So I started to give 10% off of my net income to God. And somehow, even though I had 10% less each month, I always had enough. Bills would randomly just get paid or disappear. Money would randomly come in. Like, things just happened. I never had a lack. And then when 
my wife and I, we got married, we continued this practice of, of tithing. And there came a point, this is at the start of COVID, where God was like, oh, by the way, um, I am calling you to buy a house. And we're like, God, I work in a church. You know how they pay. I'm not complaining, I'm just, we're just being real. Um, my wife is an EA. It doesn't get paid much better than I do. Like, how is this gonna happen? God's like, will you trust me? I'm like, okay, all right, cool, I'll, I'll trust you. And then we put an offer in on this house that God told us to put an offer in on, and my wife is laid off. I'm like, God, this doesn't make any sense. What, what are you telling me to do? Like, like, God, I work at a church, God. We can't cover this. We can't make this work on our own. God, you're gonna have to do something. And the thought crossed my mind. If I stopped giving to God, I could pay all the bills and we'd be fine. But my wife and I, we decided we would rather buy a smaller house that is blessed by God than have a larger house that isn't. We would rather continue to do things the way God tells us to do them than to be disobedient and get more for ourselves with God's hand withdrawn. And so we continued to give. God continued to provide. To the point now where we're not rich by any means. I don't want anyone to think that's the case. But we're, we're at a place where when God told us the end of last year, hey, I want you to tithe off your gross income. That's your pre-tax income. It's like, God, we're not getting raises. How is that going to happen? He's like, just trust me. I'm like, okay. And God's like, hey, give however much money to this project or give however many much money to this person who's hurting or, or support this, this, this ministry that, that is struggling. We're like, okay. Not because we have thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank. It's just because we know. It doesn't matter how many zeros I have in the bank. If God is for me, who can be against me? If I do things God's way and trust him with my money instead of trusting my money, God will always provide. And that is the test. What do you trust? Do you trust money or do you trust God? Is God first or is money first? Because God wants to be first. Just test me in this and see if I will not provide. Let's stand together. We're going to close in a moment here. But as we do, as we've been doing for a couple months now, I want to just give us all an opportunity to, to take a moment and, and hear from God. I know for some of you, this is a foreign thing. You're like, hearing from God, how, did, how does that work? Well, the reality is that no one comes to God on their own. They have to be called. That's what the Bible tells us. That's what Jesus tells us. So the fact that you're in this room and you believe in God means that you heard his voice at one time. God speaks to his children. And often it's just a process of learning. I'm actually, not to promote my own course or anything, but we're actually, I'm actually going to teach a group here, running through our gateway groups on hearing God's voice. If that's an area you need to grow in, check it out or check out one of our other fantastic groups that are running. This community is valuable and important. But I want to encourage us just to take a moment both now and later when, when you're at home in, in your own quiet time with God to ask God this question. Ask Him, how are you calling me to honor you with my money? What are you calling me to give to you to support your church, your ministry, your people? How are you calling me to be generous? Just take a moment and listen. Again, encourage it both now and later. But listen for God's voice. God can speak in many different ways. But I believe he wants a relationship with us and he wants to speak to us. But his voice will always be loving. It will always glorify Jesus. And it will always line up with his word. So ask God this question. And I want to encourage you when you hear an answer, to 
matter how ridiculous or outrageous or scary it might seem, trust Him. Because God is able to do more than you can ever imagine. Let's pray, Father God. Jesus, we glorify your name. Jesus, we glorify your name. you up and we put you first in our lives. Put you first in our lives, Lord. Let the only thing we look towards be or to, to be you. When life is good and life is bad, let us look to you. Where are you going? What are you doing? Let our eyes be fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him endured the cross. Scorning its shame is now seated at the right hand of God heaven where there is no issues with money, there is no issues with sickness, there is no issues. Jesus, we focus on you. Lord, I just pray right now, speak to your people. Let us hear your voice. Let us come into relationship with you. Let us receive what you have for us, God. Let us hear who you call us to be and the identity that you've given us. We honor you.